Hey friends, welcome back. I'm the Zim and this is the Zim video. And this is a video, basically a comprehensive accounting of my recent exhibition of drawing 116 portraits of Katanji Brown Jackson. I did it at the Art Produce Gallery here in San Diego, California. And I'm gonna go over everything about it from a recap to like the show, how I got it, all those things, um, some press we got, what it means to be a white artist drawing black people, um, you know, the numbers, you know, how many sold, how much I made, all that kind of stuff. And then some future things about the exhibition and the artwork. And in the description of this video, there'll be a list of all the bullet points of things and timestamps if you want to jump around. But yeah, so we'll just get started. I'm just going to go down my list here. And uh, this video will probably be kind of long kind of a self interview. So sit back, relax, enjoy the experience with me, have some tea. Let's go. All right. The first part of the video is the recap. So how did I get this exhibition? So I just recently graduated with my master of fine arts from San Diego state university. And the last year I was there, I got a, an award for a piece, um, called what role do I play? Um, and is so the award was to show to have an exhibition at our produce gallery and then so this summer we they scheduled me for in the summertime it was the exhibition was from july 7th till august 6th and the way 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 i broke it down was i wanted to draw i wanted to actually do a performance in the gallery and these days i've been doing a lot of pretty much all of my artwork has been done during live streams on my youtube channel here so you can go back and check those out as well and then also the the live streams of the 116 drawings so i wanted to do a live stream so i thought you know when i figured out what the subject matter was i like to draw things i want to my artwork i want my artwork to represent things that i can believe in and get behind and support and be positive aspects of our world um i've been drawing and doing a lot of my artwork. Um, I do a lot of different artwork. I do fun stuff like you see in the background, Billie Eilish characters from Marvel universes and stuff. But then I also do like Katanji Brown Jackson and Colin Kaepernick. So there's politically, potentially politically charged, socially charged kind of subject matter and ideas. So i kind of mixed it up. And <clears throat> with this kind of public exhibition, I wanted to stay within the themes of, you know, art that has something to say and what i've been working with these days is that kind of social justice issues and in that kind of realm i like to talk about the positive aspects of of it who's doing the good work versus the negative aspects and going like and being maybe satirical about it or, or pointing out the negativity of it I just don't want to do. It's not something I want to do. It's not something, yeah, it's not something I want to do. So thinking about this exhibition, I was like, what can I do? And then, really, you know, learning about the recently nominated at the time, Katanji Brown's Action, the first female black justice. And it got me thinking, like, how could I turn this into a performance? And I was like, thinking about the whole idea of her being the 116th, you know, justice and so I was like, oh, let me do 116 drawings of Katanji Brown Jackson and I'll put them up through the gallery um, as I do them. And yeah, so that's what I came up with. I really like the idea because it accessed a lot of what I'm interested in. I like to draw, I like to do the live streaming and I like to share ideas that I believe are should be shared more, like be amplified ideas that I, sh I believe should be amplified in our society. And this is one of them. So <clears throat> we started the exhibition. I s installed on July 6th. I gave myself a day of rest, which was the basically the opening of the exhibition. The first day, the entire the gallery had all the blank sheets of paper around the gallery. And then on the July 8th is when I started the actual exhibition. And I had this idea of putting up the blank sheets of paper to kind of see what was to come. Originally, I was going to just draw, have them in a stack and then put them on the wall. One of the things I found when I do my other live streams that I've done before in this space, and, and I did a, like a 24 hour live stream where I drew 24 drawings in 24 hours, large drawings, like kind of like the size of one of those 
um, drawings behind me, much bigger than this. Um, so they're like 24 inches by, I don't know, they're a lot bigger. These ones were nine, four, 17 inches by 21 inches. Um, the hardest part of the process was the transition between the drawings. So I was trying to think about a way, how can I do this that alleviate the transition between the drawings? And so by kind of having them prepped on the wall, where they're going to hang, how they're going to hang. So then it took me the first kind of, you know, day of drawing to figure out the kind of process, the workflow of taping them to the board. Cause this is, this is the board I used. I taped them to the board. You can still see the residue of where I, or like the, you know, after effect of where I taped them. Um, so that process took me the first day to really kind of streamline. But once I got it down, that wasn't too bad. And then I could just kind of go through them pretty easily. So I tried to streamline that. I think in the future, if I ever get to the point where I have like assistance or anything like that, that's what they'll do. They'll prep it, hand it to me. I'll draw it, hand it back you know, maybe have two boards going versus just me doing the prep work. Cause that's really the most difficult part of the whole process. Doing the drawings is, is fun. It's that kind of prep part of it. That is like, just adds time to the overall process. So once I started, um, the first couple days, I was massively anxious starting out partly because I'm just still kind of paranoid about getting sick with COVID and that kind of situation or just any kind of sickness. But since we're still living through a pandemic um, and we're still dealing with the effects of the pandemic, I was really paranoid about what if something causes me not to be able to do this performance. It, it made me so anxious to the point of really thinking about like, maybe I won't do this type of performance exhibition again, or maybe I'll give myself more flexibility. I don't know. The one thing I said to people I've said before, and I'm thinking about like, this was all done, like all for me in a way. It was like, nobody wanted me to do this. There was no expectation. Nobody really even knew what I was going to do in a lot of ways. I mean, I told the gallery curate, like the, the person that owns the gallery and she was like the only one, a couple of people that knew my plan of what I was going to do. Um, but you know, nobody was asking for it. So it was just like on me to create this space and create the performance and do it. And maybe if I knew, like if somebody, somebody said, Hey, at this point you did that Katanji Brown Jackson exhibition. We want you to do something like that in our space. If I knew there was like somebody wanted it, it maybe would have alleviated a lot of that anxiety or something. And it, we would have created a, a way that like, Hey, if, this is the plan. If it doesn't go to plan, this is the secondary plan. I don't know. But for me, based on a, I, I, I felt like I couldn't take too long to do it because partly because I was, I'm completely broke pretty much for the, and during the time of doing it, I wasn't working because, because of the exhibition it was a, one of the biggest reasons why I didn't try to get extra work through the summer, like a, like a, full-time job through the summer between the break of graduating grad school and now I'll be teaching again this fall so there was a break and I just had to kind of make do but I also knew I had this exhibition and I knew I wanted to do this performance and I knew it was going to take a good chunk of time um and it ended up taking 10 days and we'll talk more about that in a second but um I just you know there was like i knew i just couldn't take forever at it and and it just so the first three days i was massively anxious mainly around the idea of like not being able to finish and so i just kind of grit my teeth and got started and went with it and in the first day i was um i worked pretty fast and i was kind of just going and i didn't really know how long i planned kind of in my mind's eye i planned an hour per drawing and i had a feeling it wouldn't take me an hour it ended up taking me probably an average about a half hour of drawing with prep everything all inclusive prepping the page and then drawing it and then putting it on and then starting the next one so if i worked like stri strictly back to back it was roughly a half hour each drawing um and so the first day i did 14 drawings um, cause I was working kind of fast and just kind of get, cause I just wanted to get the process going and feeling like I had some substantial amount done. And then it didn't really like the anxiety didn't really dissipate until like the fourth day, the 
first three days, that same feeling of anxiety was still there. But by the third day, I had enough accomplished was part of it. Like I, I felt like I had enough accomplished and it really helped alleviate the anxiety at that point. Some of the things that were happening with the drawings, I started to get a few people in through the gallery at that point. I, I was draw, writing words. The one you're looking at here doesn't have any words on it. Um, I started writing words on some of the drawings and I try to think about it in terms, I like to write text on my draw, on my artwork. And I was trying to think about it in terms of what is appropriate for this entire kind of thing. How am I feeling personally and how maybe does this relate to maybe how she is feeling or how the overall idea is? So the, the writings, I tried to keep it related to the overall project. Um, I wouldn't write something just ridiculous like, I don't know, Spider-Man is my favorite superhero or anything like that. It would be very specific to how I was feeling, what I thought the overall vibe of this idea made sense for. And then people started coming in and seeing the drawings. And um, then I started to take some of what they were saying. Like the first person, somebody said, this is making me feel emotional. So I wrote that on the drawings. And the live streams, all the while I'm live streaming all this at the same time and trying to grab things from conversations possibly that were happening in the live stream, there really wasn't, the live streams were not as attended as, high, they weren't as well attended as I kind of hoped they would be. Um, the overall show wasn't as well attended to that as I would hope it would be, but I'll talk more about that in a little bit as well. Let me just, I'm just trying to work through like the day every day. So we made it through and about the, about the third, third and fourth day is when I started to the third day, the end of the third day, I stopped early kind of, I still made it most of the day, but my right arm started to hurt really bad from, I don't know, from drawing. I'm not sure why. And so I went home and iced it. Um, and then got back started. And well, overall though, even though I was pretty anxious at the beginning, I was also pretty excited about the thing. And it really like, you know, when they say, find the thing that you love doing and you never have to work a day in your life, those kind of concepts, it was like, I'm typically not a morning person. I typically don't like to get up, but the idea of like doing this project and live streaming and it just got me up. Like I was up every day, ready to go. I planned to start at nine every morning, but I was there by, I started, typically I started by like 8.30 or even earlier most mornings, got there, got started, and I was just really excited, really ready to go. And it was the whole process like woke me, my, like woke my spirit up, woke my being up. And I really liked it. And I really hope that this can be more of what I do as I move forward. Um, in my artistic practice and in just my life in general, I'm trying to make my artwork a, a sustainable kind of part of my lifestyle. So, so yeah, we'll, we'll keep track of that as we go. So we're working through the days where we're like on day five, starting to day four and day five is when I really started to settle into the way the mark making was starting to kind of take shape. And it became this kind of repetitious kind of muscle memory at this point. Um, I started to, I started off the first few drawings where I drew a grid on the entire sheet of paper to make sure I got it pretty accurate. But then as I went along around this third, fourth day, I just started to put a grid just in the center of the paper, um, where the, the eyes and the nose and, and kind of mouth were located. So I can make sure those were accurate. And the reason I was using a grid was just for the speed aspect of it. I've done lots of drawings in the past like that. The one you look that you can see behind it, the Colin Kaepernick was just straight up, no grid, just looking at the paper, looking at a picture, looking at the paper. And I did a lot of drawings like that for a long time, but I found, you know, there's sometimes I would get cut. Like if I put the eye in the wrong, the eye, yeah, the eye in the wrong spot or something was kind of off, it would just take me too long to fix it. And I didn't want to spend that kind of time on this project. I just wanted to kind of get through it. So I allowed myself to use the grid and then some of the drawings, you can still see the grid lines and I'm totally cool with that because that's not, you know, the, my art practice really isn't about this kind of like purity of not seeing the grids and stuff. I like you to be able to see the grid. I like you to be able to see the process. I like you to be able to see mistakes and messiness and cause it's not, it's a different for me. The entire idea really isn't about the drawing. It's about the performance, it's about the conversation. There's a lot more to it than just the drawing itself. So, 
so we're on day five now we're working through day six and then at this point it started to kind of really settle in um i got today like it ended up the whole the whole performance ended up being 10 days long. I started to slow down a little bit more. I started to plan out, like I could see how much longer it would take. You know, I didn't want to rush it. I didn't want to burn myself out. So um, by the last three days, I did 10 per day on the last three days and gave myself a lot more space like between each drawing. Um, so that's kind of what happened there. And then one thing I noticed as well, like if I do something like this again in the future, even, you know, I was disappointed that there wasn't more people in the space talking to me and that kind of idea. Um, it was actually kind of a good thing because I found when there was people in the space, I would slow, it felt like I slowed down a lot. Um, so I'm not really sure if it did, but it felt like I slowed down more. So if there was a lot of people talking, maybe, maybe I would have adjusted it again. Maybe there would have been this expectation like, oh, let him draw. Um, and they wouldn't have mind, but I felt awkward turning my back on somebody. Like if, cause I, I drew this line in the gallery that they, I didn't want people to pass because I didn't want people right on top of me, mainly because of like the kind of COVID kind of issues and things like that. But um, I just wanted some space. So it meant that people were behind me while I was drawing and it felt a little awkward to turn my back on them. The other thing I noticed as well, since I was live streaming and have people in the gallery at the same time and two potential conversations could happen, I prioritized the in-person conversation and just kind of let the live stream conversation happen whenever there wasn't somebody in the gallery. Every once in a while, I'd try to check it out. So that was basically the overview of the 10 days in terms of the actual physical feeling of how it went. We had a closing reception on August 6th, and that was pretty fun. There wasn't, not a lot of people came through, but just, you know, enough to make me feel satisfied. So that was good. The highlights, kind of the highlights, one of the main highlights. So I was actually pretty disappointed through the process. Like most, like I thought, you know, maybe after the first three days, four days, it's like, oh, somebody's physically in the space doing this art. I thought maybe the greater, whatever, I'm not, you know, I'm personally not overly familiar with what the San Diego arts community is all about, but I was really hoping that, oh, some, there's an artist in a physical space doing this performance, talking about ideas that are worth talking about, I think. Um, let's go support it let's go check out what's going on I, so i thought and i've been i've been on i was every day i was spamming out stuff on TikTok and instagram and everywhere i could in that way i obviously had the live stream going every day so i i was hoping that something would start to generate some awareness and like people would come through it's like oh i saw you, you people like i got i got hardly really like so little shares on Instagram and those kind of like social media shares of the project that it's basically, I could say I didn't get any, I got so little of it. The only place that it seemed, the only place significant that shared it was Art Produce itself. And they don't have the hugest network by themselves. So I was hoping like more friends would share out things, just more people, I, I was hoping there would be some degree of someone else helping this whole project and it didn't happen for most of the you know month that it was happening and especially while I was actually doing the in perform like in gallery performance I really hoped that there would be more people involved and and come through and got aware of it but it, it just never happened so I got pretty discouraged like after I finished the ex the performance part I was like you know sharing out constantly on my social media like everything about it. And I got really discouraged that there just wasn't some kind of like awareness, it seemed of the overall project until um, a few days before the closing reception, I got word, I got tagged on Instagram from KPBS, which is a local new, like the, like the NPR station in San Diego. They do community stuff. They do, they have like an arts program. I saw an Instagram post from KPBS with my name on, with my, you know, tag me. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. So I saw the Instagram first and it turns out it was um, Julie Dixon Evans is a local kind of 
arts columnist for the KPBS. Saw the Instagram post, reshared that. I was like, oh, awesome, yes. So then I saw the article. They had an article on like a website, which is this right here. Um, article I printed it out. Saw the article. I was like, oh, that's really cool. And then one of my per old professors at San Diego State emailed me um, that they shared it in their newsletter. So there was another write. And each of these places had a somewhat different write up of the exhibition. And not only that, my so the the write up like the the article was like an article of like everything that's going on in San Diego this weekend kind of ideas and my exhibition was the one that got the photo like mine was like kind of like the the headline exhibition like the headline of the article and so I was like uh, it just made me feel I was like finally it was like a really it was such a relief to know that there is something happened from it and it's like so finishing the story so there was the article so the the social media post the article the newsletter and then i didn't realize on the actual article on the website they had a little a little play button and they talked about it on air as well which was really great in our weekend preview some closings some openings music and theater about Paris, and even some outdoor jazz. Joining me with all the details is KPBS arts producer and editor Julia Dixon-Evans. And welcome, Julia. Hi, Maureen. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start with art produce. There is a closing reception of a pretty striking subject matter. It's over a 100 large-scale drawings of the first black woman to be sworn into the U.S. Supreme Court. Tell us about this. Yeah, this is the work of Alexander Zimmerman, or Zim, and the exhibition's titled 116 Drawings of Katanji Brown Jackson. And these are not small sketches. Zimmerman often live streams as he works, usually making these massive portraits of people who are significant figures in either social justice or current events. So his work ends up being as much about mark making and the internet as well as it is about this subject. For this project at Art Produce, he's drawn 116 portraits of Jackson, who earlier this summer was just sworn in as the first black woman on the United States Supreme Court. And this can be seen from the sidewalk. It's uh, Art Produce is just along University Avenue in North Park. It's viewable day or night, and it is really great to see all 116 of these works lined up. It's striking. So I shared all this stuff up on my social media. So like if you go to my TikTok account and Instagram accounts right now and scroll through old reels and TikTok videos, you can find all this stuff as well. So check it out there. But yeah, so that really took the weight up because at, up to this point be deciding to go back to graduate good to go to graduate school for art deciding to go kind of be more focused on visual art things have been working out really well for me and it's been really great and i just hope you know it it can't stop <laughs> it's got to keep growing and kind of keep going because i want this process i want what i'm doing to sustain my lifestyle and sustain you know it's like help it go so um if something doesn't if if it just if nobody hears about it nobody knows about it then it's kind of it kind of stops and then that gets kind of frustrating but at least now a few more people know my name i have a little bit more to put a like press is really good i'm learning as i grow as an artist press is so good because it makes somebody else be willing to give you a chance so now i can send this press with along with other exhibitions or this exhibition in the future and go like, hey, this is what people have thought about it. It's been written up about with positive, positive press. Um, so check it out. And they might go, oh, well, this guy's legit. Let me let's actually have him in my gallery or whatever, like those kind of ideas. So that really helped. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention. So one thing I forgot to mention about. So shortly after the end of the performance part of the exhibition, I got an email from the gallery. Somebody ended up walking past the gallery and bought two of the drawings, you know, right away, right after I finished the performance. They they paid for the drawings, they had them secured. And I was like, oh, what? it got me really like excited because I was like, oh, maybe people will just start 
showing up and buying drawings and that thing. But then it was just flat line until this press that I just mentioned. So it's kind of like, okay, that was, that was just a little like tease in a way. But then I ended up, um, we did end up selling more and I'll go into the numbers in a little bit. We'll, we'll do all the numbers later on in the video and I'll, I'll tell you all about that stuff as well. We did have, we got the press, which was amazing, made me feel really good and, and great. And it's what I was hoping for, something like this. And so it happened and that was amazing. And then the final closing exhibition, closing reception was good. One person that I know of came through, they told me, they said, I saw the article and I wanted to see it in person. So obviously it wasn't, it didn't bring, I I was kind of hoping and maybe, you know, since we got the press and stuff, I was like, oh, maybe we'll get a good like showing of people. But it turned out one person that I know of came through based on the press. So, hey, one's better than none, right? So that happened. And then that same person actually worked for another institution and she said she shared it with them. So maybe down the line, something else will manifest and then we can show the work again somewhere else. So, you know, you never know. One of the things, so being one of the kind of ideas that I've been working with for a long time in my artwork is, you know, this social justice idea, racism, anti-racism conversation that's happening in our society has been something that I've really been gravitated toward and really been interested in talking about. And it's really where I want, I've been focusing a lot of my energy on my work. It's like, it's the conversation that interests me the most. And it's the conversation that I want to amplify the most, like celebrating diversity and celebrating this kind of anti-racist kind of ideas. And so for me, the way it manifests a lot is a lot, I know there's a lot of different um, kind of uh, communities that suffer from racist kind of problems and that kind of thing. And for me, where I've been most gravitated toward is the white and black um, conversation around racism and anti-racism. And a lot of my work has shown that way. And I've been trying to, I've been doing a lot of, uh, introspection on how, what's the appropriate role of a white male artist representing black people in my work and how and when am I allowed to do that? And one of the kind of, so for the most part, understanding that when you do art, you typically, that kind of concept, you typically can tend to kind of preach to the choir because most people that are coming to an art exhibition are going to be on the liberal, open-minded, you know, kind of way of being. They're going to be more understanding of the concepts that we're talking about when it comes to social justice and those ideas. So you're kind of preaching to the choir. <clears throat> and so through this exhibition, I was getting a lot of positive reinforcement for what I was doing and it felt really good. And I had forgotten that I was dealing with a subject matter that could be polarizing for some people. And I ended up having one conversation that kind of took me back for a second because I just wasn't prepared. So in this kind of idea, prepared fully, like I'd been working in this kind of idea for a long time and I wrote my thesis paper on kind of a bulk of my thesis paper out of graduate school was on this conversation of what it means to be a white artist drawing black people and that kind of idea and what's appropriate. And I'll link that up in the description of this video so you can check it out yourself. You can read my whole thesis paper. Um, it's about 60 pages long, so pretty proud of it. So hopefully you will check it out. Um, but I wasn't, I didn't prepare myself for a, co a confrontation around it. And so when I did have a confrontation around it, I wasn't quite ready for it. And so going moving forward, I would definitely remind myself, okay, we're talking about racial issues here. We're talking about issues that are can be polarizing. Be prepared for somebody to enter this space and not agree with you or not think you're doing it the right way and that kind of idea. What I ended up like after a conversation I had with this person, and it wasn't like 
too heated in any way. It was just they didn't agree that as a white man, I should be a drawing a black woman is really kind of what I boiled it down to. And then they had issues with how the money was working, how like how, how and I'll get into that after I talk about this, but um, how, you know, selling the work and what what that all meant. And so we'll we'll break that down in a little bit as well. But to go back to the, you know, the issue and the idea of being a white male artist drawing black people and what does that mean? You know, there's appropriate and inappropriate times to do that. And for myself, you know, some of the the times where I feel it's inappropriate is in exploitation of ideas. And one of the things like trying to just use imagery to um, you know, I don't know, exploit an idea or get shock value or get some kind of non-authentic response from it. An example that a lot of went around the arts community for a while was the Emmett Till drawing done by Dana Schutz, um, where she did an abstract version of him in an open casket and it, it raised a lot of controversy because you're, you're starting to kind of flirt with this idea of exploiting black trauma and as a white artist she was also a white artist so it's there's a line there that i decided personally if it seems like i might be exploiting black trauma i don't want to cross that line and i had drawn people like i drew george floyd i drew brianna taylor that was while I was still learning about this concept of exploiting black trauma. And it's not something that I'm interested in doing. And so I'm trying to be very, if basically the line I drew was if any, any black person was like, um, a victim of violence resulting from racist actions and lost their life because of it, especially lost their life because of it. Um, I wouldn't draw them. I would, they would not be a focus of my art practice. And so it kind of started to trans transition me into going, well, I still want to have this conversation about racism, about anti-racism, about these concepts, about the black white issue. How can I do that in a way that makes me feel that it's appropriate? And so I, want to use my platform to amplify these ideas to get them out more and for me the idea of katanji brown jackson being appointed to the supreme court is a perfect example of that like something that should be amplified something we should be talking about more because it's only a positive to have more diversity in our society in our country and have that representation as well to kind of help you know teach and show the future generations of what they can do, you know, what they can also be part of and, 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 and do. So that's a big part of it. What I distilled out of the kind of, um, re uh, objection to me drawing Katanji Brown Jackson was that I'm now trying to take black joy away in a sense. I was like, instead of, you know, there's the one idea of, of exploiting black trauma. And then there's one idea of exploiting, black joy and it got me thinking like i didn't have a good answer for her well i didn't have a complete answer i had a good answer and i told her all the things that i just told you about celebration about wanting to amplify positive ideas wanting to use my platform as best i can to do those things without replacing anyone else's voice you know if anyone else wants to draw Katanji Brown Jackson, they can do it too. If they want to have the same conversation, they can do it too. I'm not trying to replace any voice, anybody's other conversations. I'm just trying to add to the entire conversation. So that's a big part of it. And then in, upon reflection of this conversation I had with this person, I realized, you know, I think it's important to, when it comes to race, and artists and draw and celebrating, I think it's important to focus on what makes us similar versus what makes us different. And so this idea that I'm not allowed to draw Katanji Brown Jackson because there is black joy involved, but there's also American joy involved. There, there is also a celebration of diversity that is, you know, I find important. So there's a lot of things that makes us similar as an American and as somebody that 
wants the same things that Katanji Brown Jackson does, I think that that unites us. And I think I have, I, I think that gives me a, a space to then express my own joy in this kind of process as well. So that's kind of where I came to after realizing that. And then so, you know, in the kind of long run of this kind of conversation, this part of the conversation is just reminding myself that because of the subject matters that I'm working in, being prepared that somebody might disagree with me and and having something to give them, um, not telling them they're wrong, not telling them they're right, but just being like, I hear you and this is my truth, you know? So it's not like I'm trying to say, no, you're wrong. I can do whatever I want. It's more like, okay, you're allowed to have that opinion. This is my opinion. I think the fact that I, it's all of comes from a place of love. It comes from a place of wanting the best. It comes from a place of, comes from a place of hope and those kind of things. So yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'd love to hear your response on you know, how you feel about me being a white artist and drawing black figures and that kind of idea doesn't matter to you. Is there something I miss you think I'm missing in this conversation? I would love to add to it um, and to keep going because this is one of the things that for me is my artwork is every piece of artwork that I do is basically a sketch for the next thing I do. So what I learned from this, even though it's a final piece, performance and final piece, all 116 drawings are final pieces. They are also a sketch for the next thing I'm doing. Um, so yeah, so we'll see as we move along in the future, I'll, I'll, I'll learn about this and then move along And this. So this brings me to the idea of the numbers. So we're going to talk about all the numbers involved in this kind of aspect of the exhibition. So we did 116 drawings. It took me 10 days. 10 live streams. Um, each drawing took about 30 minutes, as I said before. We ended up selling um, nine of the drawings. So that was a, and each drawing was being sold for $200 a piece. Um, and then two of the drawings went to Katanji Brown Jackson herself, which I'll talk more about in a little bit as well. Um, so that's 11 total drawings are no longer in my possession. So now I, I have 105 drawings and my plan is to keep those 105 drawings together and maybe solicit, try to get another exhibition of this work or maybe this and more of my work because I have tons of work that is just sitting in the closet <laughs> that I want people to see. So um, hopefully that'll happen as well. So we'll see what happens as time goes on. As far as the the money aspect of it goes, this is what when I first started the the project, I was thinking I was gonna don't I, I I want to make sure that all of my work from here until the future, some of it is getting given back to the community. Um, I want my platform. I you know ideally I get to a point where I'm you know making a significant kind of contribution by selling my work, by go, by giving it back to uh, institutions that could use the money um, and use the help. One of the things that I'm a firm believer in, if you want to make change in our, if you want to make positive change in our society, the two best things to do that is using your vote and using your money. So, because if you want change to happen, we policy change is what happens, you know, protesting, doing a drawing about Katanji Brown Jackson or Colin Kaepernick or the drawing itself isn't quite enough. I, I don't believe the drawing just says, Hey, there's this idea, but to put like boots on the ground and, and make a change, you need to use your vote and use your money. So like demonstrations and protests are important to spread awareness, but they're not going to make policy change. And this, you know, artwork, is political and artwork can be represent an idea of protest. So, however, it's not going to make a change. What's going to make a change is using your vote and using your money. Um, if you want to see things happen, because it takes um, changing of policies to make real progress in our society. 
And the way pro um, policies are changed is when you vote for them. But then also when you when you support the people that are advocating for policy changes and getting the word out and doing the work. So giving them money so that to support that idea is um, super important. And so I knew I was like, OK, I want to do these the series drawing Kataji Ron Jackson. It's it's in line with what I've been talking about, what, I, what I'm interested in talking about in my artwork um, when it comes to like social kind of outwardly social work that I'm doing. And then I also wanted to, if I should make any money off of this, um, <clears throat> this exhibition, I want to give some back. And originally I was going to, the original breakdown was I was going to donate 20% to NARAL Pro Choice America. 30% was going to go to the gallery because that's their commission. That's what they take off of the drawings. And then that would have left, um, 50% that would have came to me. Um, shortly after things started to kind of get together for the exhibition, the Roe versus Wade um, decision came down through the Supreme Court. And it made me um, realize that there's a, you know, thankfully, I should say, thankfully, it made me realize that this subject, what I'm doing is more important than me. I'm surviving enough. I'm making it by, I don't need to take anything out of this. This other idea is more important. This, you know, giving money to people to support freedom of choice in our country and those kind of ideas is way more important than me making money off of this project. So I changed my, um, you know, break down to 70% to NARL Pro Choice America, and then 30% was gonna to go to the gallery. I did this, uh, that's the way I'd been promoting it for a while. I did the whole performance about, you know, basically once I finished the performance and the exhibition was just up, the gallery emailed me and says, we're not gonna take any of the money. We want you to have that 30% if we if you should sell any of the work. I didn't plan, I didn't, I had, high degree of skepticism that I was going to sell any work. And at the same time, when they told me that I was like, please let me sell some work because I am flat broke right now. I have no money. And luckily at the time of the two that sold that I told you about that sold right after I finished the performance part. So that would have been $400. So at that time I rent was due. And I was about a hundred and hundred dollars short on rent. And that for that 30% out of that 400 was roughly that amount. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to allow myself to take that 30% from the sales and put it toward life. Um, and these expenses just to make sure I can, I can keep going. I was again, also confronted with, you know, Am I, is it appropriate for me to make money off of Katan, like the face of Kataji Brown Jackson? And it's something I'm still working through in this particular case. So we'll get back to that. We'll answer the rest of that question in a minute. Let me break down the numbers a little bit more. So we ended up selling nine. So that was $1,800 total. I, you know, 70% of that went to NARL Pro Choice America. So that was, $1,260 went to NARL Pro Choice America. So that leaves 540 left over that I get to use for make, paying bills and living expenses and that kind of idea. So and already, I already told you 100, about 100 of it already went to um, rent, help pay for rent at the time. And I am, you know, I pers right at this moment right now of recording this video, I'm behind on pretty much all my bills. So this is going to help me get caught up just a little bit. And next month I start working for, for San Diego State University again. So it'll get me that even that much more caught up. So the question is, what is appropriate for an artist to how, when is it appropriate for an artist to make money off of their work? I don't fully know the answer to that question. I'm just gonna be straight up. 
I've kind of come to the decision. I my goal moving forward is to so I have like Billie Eilish in the background. I have like MCU heroes in the background. You know, I don't know. To be honest, I don't know the answer to that question because Katanji Brown Jackson's a black woman because there is this connection to social justice and these ideas. You know, does that make it does that give different meaning to me as the artist making a little bit of money off of this? And should I or shouldn't I versus if I sell like an MCU hero because it's a comic book hero who happens to also be played by an actor who also happens to have a face <laughs> or Billie Eilish. Like, am I allowed to sell Billie Eilish in the background? Um, I don't know. But I guess moving forward, my hope is that I can uh, make money off of art that isn't as controversial but where's that line of controversy? And then if I decide to do a project like this moving forward, 100% of it gets donated to somewhere? Or am I allowed to as an artist to, is this work, even though it is controversial in some ways, am I allowed to still make some money off of it so that I can keep doing this kind of work? Is this work important enough to keep doing? Is this a work Am I allowed to use this kind of work to help me sustain so I can keep having this conversation? I don't know. I don't know what the answer is totally. And I'm going to have to work on figuring that out as time goes on. And hopefully I'll have lots of opportunities to have that conversation with myself. The last part of this video is um, I got work during the after the basically after the close of the exhibition, I got an email from somebody that the story, this is the story I've heard at this point. Somebody in Kataji Brown Jackson's sphere office or something saw the exhibition online or something, notified her, and then she called her mom and her mom called her friend who lives in San Diego to check it out, get a hold of me. And so that has happened. And so now I've, and then there was a little bit of back and forth, um, between me and the woman about what drawings to give to Katranji Brown Jackson. It turned out she requested one of them. Um, and then I just wanted to give her the 116th one as well, because I just felt like it was appropriate. So I, I sent her two drawings. They're on their way there to her now. In a lot of ways, they're, they're being hand delivered. I didn't ship them. I just, they're being hand delivered through this contact because this, this person is going to the investiture, which is, I guess, where Katanji Brown Jackson gets officially, officially, officially appointed to the Supreme Court. And so she's going to hand deliver these drawings. So I, I'm looking forward to when I get a response from Katanji Brown Jackson after she like receives the drawings hopefully i'll get a picture of her with the drawings or something like that uh, or we'll get to, i don't know i don't know what to expect at this point all i know is that they're on their way to her hopefully she likes them that she's enough that they just don't get buried in the archives they actually get shown maybe in her office or framed or something like that that's what i hope will happen is they're they're actually celebrated versus just like, oh, this is nice that somebody did this and let's just put it in the basement with everything else. I'm not sure what'll happen, but um, but it's still exciting that she's, you know, that this is this has happened and she's getting uh, some of the drawings. So I'll keep you posted on that. And that, I guess, sums it up. Um, thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions for me on this whole idea, if I anything I said during this inspired a que more questions or thoughts or comments, please let me know in the comments on the video. If you happen to have resources or ability to help me show this work more, please, please, please reach out to me. I have this and many other works. If you want to support me as an artist, I have an Etsy store with artwork up. The artwork you see behind me is up there. Um, but at end, I also have NFTs for sale. So I'll link up all the links to all the places in the description. The NFTs 
are leaning heavily on the digital contract idea. So with the NFT, you would get a drawing lesson from me. You would also get an artist talk by me and you can also get an interview by me. You get all three of those things if you own the NFT and if you sell the NFT, they get transferred to the new owner of the NFT. So yeah, keep that in mind. I'd love to come to your institution and talk about the work that I'm doing. And that's one great way to do it is to buy the NFT and I can we can make that happen. Um, yeah. And of course, like I said already, if there's anything else you'd like me to share with you, please let me know in the comments and I'd be happy to do it. And in the meantime, be loving, kind, and patient. Peace.